So what happens to teachers who do pack their bags and head off overseas in search of greener pastures? Is it really all it's cracked up to be? Our video journalist Logan Church filed this report. That's Tippi Tahapehi and Nicola Nakamura, teachers at Colton Public School. It's one of the biggest in the area, with about 900 primary pupils. We're standing in the middle of Tippi's Tadeo classroom. But where exactly is the school? Smack bang in the middle of Sydney. <laughs> Tippi grew up in Waikato and trained there as a teacher. She worked in New Zealand for almost two decades, before moving to Australia with her then teenage son in 2000. Well, when I started here in, 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 at Carlton Public School, I was, I was quite scared actually, because when I was teaching in New Zealand, it, I found it very hard. It wasn't structured. It was, um, we had to make a lot of the resources and we had a lot of meetings in, in the holidays. Um, it was quite onerous. It was, a lot of pressure was put on, on teachers. But what she found in this Sydney school is quite different. Well, when I started here in my couple of, my, couple of weeks, um, I felt that the curriculum was more structured. It was easy to follow and um, you had colleagues that were here to help you. In 2000, her starting wage was 50,000 Australian dollars a year. That's more than the new teachers are currently paid in New Zealand, 18 years on. You know, I don't like to go on about money, but there is a big difference in pay compared to at home. A shortage of learning support staff has been a big issue in New Zealand. Although the government announced last month it would fund 600 new coordinator positions over the next two years. But they're not in place yet. Unlike at Carlson Public, as reading support teacher Nicola Nakamura explains. In our school, at every grade, there's a, a, um, a support teacher that works with that grade. On, in stage one, there's two, plus another teacher who also works with other grades. So there's really three of us with um, year one and two. Then three and four, there's other teachers, support teachers. Five and six, more support teachers. But it hasn't always been this easy. And many of the issues that teachers are obsessed about in New Zealand are similar to those faced by their counterparts in Australia decades ago. Sally Hill trained in Wellington in the 1940s and taught for 60 plus years before retiring last year. Most of her career was spent in Australia and had front row seats during one of the country's largest ever teacher strikes in 1965. Sitting in her dining room in Sydney, she told me what teaching was like before that. You could actually see, see holes, cracks in the floors. We had one light in the, in the classroom and 30 children. And I mean, that sounds, sounds almost um, like a third world country. And I'm not saying that all schools were like that, but this particular school that I went to, those were the circumstances. But she says industrial action changed everything. More resources, better infrastructure, better training, and support teachers were introduced. We even got fans in the classrooms and better lighting and carpets on the floor, which <laughs> was, was, all, was just almost too much to, to, uh, to believe it actually happened. But all of that happened through teachers going on strike. With more strikes on the horizon in New Zealand, Sally has a clear message for her Kiwi counterparts. You know, the common saying is the um, squeaky door gets the most oil. So the louder you speak up, the better it the, oh, Well, the, the louder you speak up, the more you're going to achieve. You know, don't wait for, for the government to decide when you uh, need a, a pay rise, you need to persevere, you need to just keep on with your strike action and, and continue because I've seen the benefits. That report by Logan Church talking to New Zealand teachers in Sydney.